10 second security tip. Go. It's time to get rid of remote administration. You're all used to trying to get rid of local administration and not letting your users do things. But if you get rid of remote administration, you can stop a whole bunch of ransomware and malware from lateral movement. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Recorded in front of a live audience in San Francisco. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I'm the producer of the CISO series. To my immediate right is the co-host for this episode, Mike Johnson. Mike, make some noise so people understand who you are. (laughs) I guess the audience is making some noise for me, which is pretty awesome. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I am to the right, even though if you're listening to this, that doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter. But there are people here watching us because we are live at the SF Isaka conference yes. in San Francisco. And we are we are the closing keynote. We're wrapping up this whole show. These people are exhausted of three days of education for the CPE credits. I don't know if you know this, but this show that you're watching now actually is a demerit to your CPE yeah, credits. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, there goes the whole audience. Close the door. Close the door. <laughs> yeah, don't let them out. All right. The other person you just heard speaking is Andy Ellis, who is the operating partner at Wild Ventures. He is also my co-host. So, uh, Andy, let's hear your voice again. I think I'm a co-host, but today I'm officially a guest. You're officially a guest here. Quote, unquote. Quote, unquote. Now, I do want to mention that uh, everything that you hear on our show and other stuff can be found on our website, CISOseries.com. And God willing, by the time people actually hear this episode will have launched CISOseries.com. I don't know if you, I mentioned this, Mike. But oh, the new website, finally. There's a new Ooh. website, and you said, oh, nothing ever happens with a, a new website launch. They usually it go all smoothly. goes perfectly, every time. I, I hate to burst this bubble, but we were about to launch, we noticed a major, major problem I'm that we shocked. have to deal with. I know, I, it's a shock. I'm utterly shocked. So things and when you have a problem, back. it's DNS. Yeah, well, it's no, this always one's not DNS. a DNS. Or, or this, unless it's BGP. This was an upgrade for a WordPress theme that literally removed a feature that we had. And that is making things a little more difficult. You want that feature. No, we do want that feature. All right. I do want to mention our three sponsors. Those of you here in the room can see them on the giant screen right here. They are Code42, Sotero, and Constella Intelligence. We are thrilled that they are sponsoring this live show here as well. And you're going to hear a lot more about them later in the show. But first... I want to talk about the uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, of which we just had um, Chris Novak speak about it here on this stage just a little while ago. He's one of the authors of the report. Yes, he is. And I just want to bring up a a few interesting little tidbits, just get your quick reactions to it. First, business email compromise has actually doubled over the past year. Is that a shock to you? Or is like, yeah, we can see more people getting suckered by social engineering. It makes a lot of sense because there's like a built-in theme to get people's attention. And then there's also the folks are more remote. You used to be able to just turn around and go, hey, did you send me this email? No, I didn't send you that email. But the reality is right now, you can't just turn around and do that. What do you think? No, I totally buy that. And even if it's not checking with the person next to you, if they sent the email, it's when you get that crazy email and you know it's fake. And so you tell everybody around you, you're like, oh my God, guess what I just saw? That was a big part of our security awareness programs. Nobody really talked about that. But just the education of the people around you defending taught you how to defend. And I think we've lost that. Here's another little tidbit I thought was interesting. He showed the stock price of companies six months after they've been breached. These are public companies, their stock price versus the NASDAQ. And the interesting is there wasn't a sizable difference, positive or negative, to whether you had a breach or you did not have a breach. So I think we should start the index of breached companies, which buys stock like one month after breach and sells <laughs> it five months later. I, th- I think you're onto something. Yeah, we could see how this works. Yeah, put your wasn't, money where your stats are. Wasn't there like an AI bot that would buy stock or or short it? I can't remember, depending on what Donald Trump said. This was before you oh, I could totally president. buy that. Yeah, that, that's but it didn't. One. But it didn't actually work. I think that was the, the bottom line. Here's the other interesting tidbit, and the last one I want to throw out is, you know that little um, colored warning that you get at the top of your email that says, this is an external email? It's, you know, it's red, it's yellow, it's green. He said it becomes more effective if you change that color over time. Like, so this month it's red, next month it's yellow, the month after that's green. Interesting. 
I totally buy that. So humans are hardwired. In fact, all animals are. We've evolved to ignore our environment because there's too much in the environment. So you're always filtering it out. And so things that don't change, you stop noticing. Like it's literally inattention blindness. So by changing it, it causes you to look at it again. Walk a mile in this CISO's shoes. How do you go about making a business case for further investment in cybersecurity initiatives? Now, this is a question posed in the CISO Survival Guide by Stott May and was recently posted by Greg Anderson. For this question, the article offered advice such as getting supporters, trying to sell it to the customer, and understanding how it would get funded. So I'll start with you, Mike. What have you been your strategies and how widely do those strategies vary? So I thought this was an interesting survey. And I one of the things I really wanted to highlight was the understanding how it will get funded. I, I think a lot of folks, especially earlier in your careers, you don't realize that there's a finite amount of money that a company has to spend. And so you just assume that, hey, if I'm going to go get another dollar, it's just coming from somewhere. Uh, and I don't really care about that. But understanding where it comes from helps you understand the business, which kind of leads into the next part of understanding how your business makes money. And if you don't understand how your business makes money, it's that much more difficult to say, well, here's where I need my funding. Here's what I need. And so if you understand, say, you're a B2B company, it really helps to talk with your customers, understand what their needs are from a security perspective. And that then helps you make a valid business case internally for, hey, we should actually spend some money this will help us either get new customers, retain the existing ones. But if you don't understand that, you really have a hard time making a business case for it. And I think involving the business stakeholders is key to the success of that. If you're going to say this will bring in more customers, then the head of sales needs to agree with you. <laughs> oh, good, that's a good point. Right? Very good because point. you've just signed them up for bringing in more revenue. And if they're not going to sign up for that, and it's also, they got to believe and, that and they've got to believe that that's going to happen. You also shouldn't walk in with a hard and fast proposal. If you say, look, here's a risk area, and this is the one true way to solve it. Everybody's going to say no. <laughs> if you walked in and said, look, here's a cheap way we could tackle it. It's not great. It'll reduce our risk, maybe 20%. Here's some outliers we'll still have. Here's a medium way. And here's the platinum way. Recognize nobody will ever spend on the platinum way. It's just there so you can get the medium way. But give people an option so they can buy in and be part of the decision making because then they will champion the choice that they drove towards. It's it's a classic sales technique of like, you know, oh, your budget is X dollars. Well, let me just show you the top of the line stereo that we have here. I know you're not going to buy it, but I just want to show it to you. And so the idea is when they get the the medium level item, they're like, well, they know what they're missing out on. Right. But they know they got a deal. And they're like, look, I could have spent an arm and a leg, but this worked. Let me ask also, do you get the sense that there are some cybersecurity people that have this sense of entitlement? Like, yeah, you need to spend it because that's the way it should be. And they don't literally think about the business at all in this respect? Yes. I, I think there's a lot of that going on. Where, where would, would you say more than, than should be the other way? Like, do you think that's the predominant way that they, they're sort of demanding budget? No, I, I don't know that it's necessarily the predominant way, okay. but- it's certainly more than it should be. Yeah, I think the further you are away from the budgeting process, the more likely that that is going to be yes. predominant. So an architect who's not part of budgeting will probably come at it with a, well, you should just do this. Whereas a CISO <laughs> who's closer to the budgeting process probably is a little more nuanced in that conversation. We hope. You hope? <laughs> so the last thing I want to hear from both of you, just give me one quick tip that, and you think from your history of, of getting budget, like what was one effective technique that worked for you? For me, it was going to some of the other leaders and having conversations in advance and can kind of convincing them that they need this, that it's actually something that will help them. Then when the discussions are happening with the rest of leadership, they're in there helping defend your ideas and maybe even defending them when you're not even there in do other they, conversations. Do they, do they in some cases actually propose it rather than you proposing it? I think it should still be my responsibility to propose it um, because it is something that I'm requesting. But it could be something that they're talking about in other conversations with other people when you're not in that particular conversation. Yes. The reason I bring that up is I have a friend who is a comedy writer for Ellen. 
And he said the only way he could get his jokes on the show is if he made the producer believe he wrote them and then he could <laughs> yeah. get them on. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Code 42. You know, security teams rose to the challenge during an unprecedented crisis, helping their organizations to suddenly support an entire remote staff while keeping data safe, effectively overnight. Now, as organizations gradually and cautiously move out of the adapt-or-die mode into the post-pandemic era, security teams have the opportunity to reimagine data security. Code 42, the insider risk management leader, is here to help. With Code 42, security professionals can protect corporate data and reduce insider threats while fostering an open and collaborative culture for employees. The Code 42 Insider product allows security teams to effectively mitigate data exposure and exfiltration risks without disrupting legitimate collaboration. The Code 42 Instructor Microlearning Solution is an insider risk education offering that improves insider risk awareness by focusing on the creation of holistic security-oriented cultures. To learn more, visit code42.com slash show me. Pay attention. It's security awareness training time. Andy, I want to know this. How do people actually change their behaviors? Now, in a commentary on dark reading, Javed Malik of No Before noted that doctors tell him to watch what he eats and work out regularly. And when he hears this, he nods his head in agreement. But that's where it ends. He likens this to the same challenge of security awareness programs. Making someone aware of an issue is not enough to stimulate a behavioral change. Would it make sense to start with a deep understanding of how people can make behavioral changes and then build education around that? How have you seen people change and how have you fit security programming within that? So I think you need to tie it to the outcomes and show that you're a coach along that path. You know, I sat down with my doctor, this was before COVID, and he looked at me and he looked at my numbers. He said, you know, you're, you're a little overweight. And he said, you know, my job is to be your coach, to help put you in the right position. Do you want to be there when your kids get married? That's a doozy. Right? And now that starts the right conversation. This isn't about, oh, I should just be healthy. This is now about longevity and working around that. That's a good trigger. I actually did a great job. I brought my weight down. I brought my cholesterol down. Then COVID happened. Um, (laughs) I'm now working to get back to where I was. But in the same way that often when we talk to people in the enterprise and we tell them what to do, it's disconnected from the why. And in fact, sometimes it doesn't even help. Like we tell them, don't click shit. And this is my soapbox. You three have heard this before a lot, but like we tell people not to click stuff. How many people have changed jobs at some point? And the first thing you have to do is click on a bunch of links or you don't get paid. So telling people not to click things disconnects from their reality and they don't see how that would tie to defending the enterprise. Like what's the real problem here? But if you say, we don't want to have you authorize something without your permission. So make sure you're not on a website and logging in that you don't know why you're there. Like change the conversation to connect to the outcome rather than just being a lecture. That's a great example. I love like, do you want to be there when your kids what, get married get or married? graduate? Or when, they, when they get married. When they get married. All right, Mike. So I, I think it's an interesting question about the fact that we've constantly been approaching this from a security mindset, security mentality. Like, of course you don't click on on things. Of course you don't open emails. Like everybody knows this. But the reality is, like Andy's saying, that's actually how people operate. And they kind of have to open emails. And there's certain people in your company that have to click on basically every link that's sent to them because that's their job. So you, you have to make sure you're thinking about the outcomes. But what I would really like to see more of is the behavioral psychology approach to security. Like actually bring in people who understand how people think, talk to them, get their feedback, get their advice, and approach people from a human personality perspective rather than this is 100% security. We're seeing some of that with the gamification concepts, with leaderboards, and trying to encourage people through these are the outcomes that we're wanting to see. 
hey, look at all of the positive outcomes of those outcomes. Like people are doing the behavior that is beneficial and here's the advantage of that. Here's why that actually really matters. So I really do think it's maybe a little bit less and maybe even a little bit less on the security outcomes, Mm -hmm. but more around thinking how people think and approaching them from those perspectives. And a key piece of that, thinking about how humans think, is the example I gave is actually a dangerous one. Because if you're the security person and you say, the company will be out of business if you don't do this. Oh, they could care less. Don't care. People want to argue with you. So my biggest recommendation to apply human psychology is always downplay the risk. If you're the security professional, educate someone on the facts. And if you think the risk is somewhere between a five and a nine on whatever your magic scale is, sell the five. Because if you try to sell the nine, they can easily argue that it's anywhere below that. But if you sell the five, they can argue with you. But now they're going to argue up and they're going to say, why are you downplaying this? This is much, much worse. Oh, my God, I have to fix it right now. So hold on, it's, it's making you more aware of security? It's making them more aware of security because they walk through the process of talking themselves into believing that the security is a problem. This goes back into make them think that they wrote the joke. Exactly. Who's our sponsor this week? We also have Sotero as a sponsor. Now, I want to start off with one question here. Does your company protect its data with security solutions designed to provide network security? Probably. Or security for applications and databases. If your answer is yes, why not use a security solution designed to protect the actual data itself? Well, the good news is that you can. You can protect the actual data itself, and you can do it easily with data security solutions from Sotero. Sotero has a single pane data security platform that protects structured and unstructured data wherever it resides, and even if the data is being used. That is key, by the way. So this is something you definitely want to look into if securing sensitive data is at the top of your list. And if it's not at the top of your list, why isn't it? Visit their website at soterosoft.com. That's S-O-T-E-R-O-S-O-F-T dot com. It's time to play What's Worse. All right. Now, for those of you who have never heard this show before, this is the most popular segment. This is uh, What's Worse, which the game pretty much sounds like what the title is. I'm going to present two horrible, horrible scenarios. Two that you would not like at all whatsoever. But it's a risk management exercise. And Mike and Andy here have to decide which one of these two horrible scenarios do they actually think is worse? And also, I'm going to want to get uh, your feedback as well after they determine, you know, whether it's essentially situation or situation B. We're going to play two rounds of this, gentlemen. And by the way, they're always submitted from listeners. So by the way, if you have what's worse scenarios, send them to me. Do not send them to them. Send them to me. <laughs> I don't want I'll them for- seeing I'll forward them, them to David, oh, yeah. really. By send the way, them they to don't me. See, I should also point out, they never see these beforehand. They're always a surprise to them. Okay, so their first hearing it is the same time you're first hearing it as well. This comes from Eric Block, who is with Sprinkler, and he asks, what is worse, having bad endpoint protection agents installed that provide great telemetry and log data, okay, or having the best endpoint protection agent that doesn't generate any telemetry or log data? So the... As I read this, or, or, or and by the way, just to, for those of you who haven't heard Mike try to answer one of these, what he usually does is stall for time by just reiterating what the question and was. And what, what's even better is when you tell people that, I'm getting that much more time out of it. So it, yeah, I, it's not so much that, that, that much that's more really, time. That's really helping. So, so, wait, so now are you meta stalling for time? <laughs> I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to make you more self conscious about this. Layers on layers. But it's not working. Nope. It doesn't do, make do, you more do, self conscious. Does not, does not yeah. work. So the two <laughs> items one, you've got an endpoint agent that is kind of okay but it actually gives you information back no, to your No, it's a central. bad endpoint agent, bad endpoint but it gives agent. you great telemetry data. Okay. Um, so and, it doesn't do the, a good job of being an actual endpoint. So it doesn't prevent things. Yes. And, but the second one does prevention, but doesn't tell you anything about it. Correct. This is easy. Yes. Um, I, I, I would much rather have the telemetry 
forwarded back to the central systems where I can actually get this, basically treat all the endpoints as sensors and gather that information all in one place and, and take advantage of that. Um, if the endpoints aren't blocking things themselves, I can still do something about it. If, if a bunch of my endpoints are blocking the same thing and I don't know about that, there's something systemic going on that I'm just completely unaware of. So I, I would think that... You're, you're more interested in information than action. So I'm generally going to lean on... So there's prevention and versus detection is kind of what we're talking about here. Yes. Um, I'm always going to lean a little bit more on the detection side than on the prevention side. Okay. Andy, your take, agree or disagree with Mike? Tell me why I'm wrong, Andy. Yeah, so so David and I have a little game when I'm the only co-host, which is if I, as the co-host, can make the guest agree with me, I win. And if I can't, then David wins. Because I always want disagreement. So, so in this case, David, you win. All right. Because I think if I had an autonomous agent that was really good and effective and didn't have my SecOps team have to wade through tons of telemetry about stuff that it should have dealt with already, I would totally take that over an agent because agents suck by the way like if i have to have an agent it's impacting the user and all it's doing is extracting knowledge that then i have to do more work for but it didn't actually do anything for me yeah that's an easy call on this one all right but clearly it wasn't an easy call for mike so i think the what's worse questionnaire wins all right now thank you by the way and i'm going to also say mike andy's correct now all right here we go second one oh by the way i haven't actually asked let me ask the audience okay so between the two Bad endpoint agents installed that provide great telemetry or log data or best endpoint protection that doesn't generate any log data at all. First one, uh, by applause. How many like think, the first one, by the way, which one's worse? Which is the worst scenario? So the first scenario, uh, bad endpoints with great data. Applaud. That That's, means you agree with me, so applaud a lot. That's a good Okay. <laughs> boo. Who's booing? <laughs> <laughs> now... Again, worst of the ways, who thinks the second situation is worth is that great endpoint protection, but it gives you awesome data. It means you would be agreeing with Mike. By applause. Oh, oh my. Oh. Oh. Wait, someone's <laughs> politely applauding. <It's> your coworker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, thank you, Marcus. Golf clap from the coworker of Mike who wants to still be employed yes. tomorrow. <laughs> Smart move, by the way. All right, here comes our second scenario. All right, this is from uh, Jonathan Waldrop of Insight Global. All right, you're constantly spending money on new tools, but leaving the default configuration in place, all right? So it's just an endless stray of new tools purchased. You just, you plug it in, turn it on, and you do nothing else. Okay, before you do the next one, like it's got to be the next one's better because I can't <laughs> imagine anything worse than that. Hold but, on. But let's see. Yeah, having a team that is set in their ways and they are staunchly resisting any new tech or tools. So, so Andy has to take this one first, right? All right, Andy, you go yeah. first on this one. Okay. Any wait, you have a team set in their ways and resisting any new tech or tool. No, no, I will actually take that the first one is actually worse. First one is worse. The first is one is worse. Well, if I have a team that refuses to do work, I can replace them. Um, if I have tools that all I do is deploy them and like leave them the way they were configured. Like I have shelfware. I'm spending lots of money that makes me think I'm getting better, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I like this one because it's two very different problems. It's not usually it's like, here's the same problem with, with a slightly uh, different access. Okay. But yeah, I think I would, I would rather have the team that's set in their ways because I feel like I could potentially ch alter that one. No, no, by the way, I, I can't stress this. No, 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 no. In the future, work. I could. Every now, time. Every time I do this. In the future. Yeah. This is the way the watch works. The that's a situation yeah. you have no capability. I have of changing no capability it. to change it. Yeah. I guess I, as I, good I, a manager as you are, stuck with those people. You can't change it. Yeah, I think I still take the like tools that we never bother configuring because most tools don't work out of the box. All right, so that's the worst scenario. That's the first the worst one. Scenario. Okay, Mike, which one's worse? So I, I generally uh, err on the side of the people one, preferring to have to deal with tools. So these two scenarios. You've got one side, you've got a group of folks who are problematic. Got another side with the tools are problematic. And I'm actually going to prefer to have, uh, I would rather be. Um, this is, by the way, I well, don't this think is a, this is a good word. one. I've never seen Mike stumped. stumped him. Yeah, these are, I think yeah. you're stumped. So I, am, I am stumped and trying to buy time. Because usually to, he to goes, he, 
Yeah, well, I just answered. Well, you had time because Andy answered first. Well, but I was I answered quickly. Yes. yes. I don't stall for time. Yes. So I'm sorry, Mike. Should I have stalled for more time? Yeah, no, thank you. Oh, no, yeah. I, no, I have that. to rethink my answer. Yeah, no, yeah, no, same yeah, answer. Yeah. Um, what's worse would be uh, the team of people who were stuck in their ways. If I've got tools that I'm not changing the default configurations, that sucks. Um, but I would rather have that than have a team that is just kind of working against every idea that, that you might be coming up with. All right. So you split again yes. on this one. So reminding everybody, I want to get applause on this one. Again, which is the worst scenario? The constantly spending money on tools, but you leave the default config in place by applause. How many people think that's worse? <laughs> again, booing. I don't. I don't understand what the booing during well, because the applause of the what's worse because it's a worse thing. They're saying boo because it's worse. They don't want to applaud. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're yes. applauding them. They're, yeah. they're so, making so, noise. So now, really now, now you're trying to get <laughs> folks on your side by yeah. I'm totally trying to yeah. work the crowd here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna see if you can beat your one one golf clap Hold from on. the last yeah. time. So, um, all right. Now the other one is having a team that's set in their ways and staunchly resists new tech and tools by applause. Which one? Who believes that's worse? Oh, that's like a I, that even split. split. Almost split, that but I think split. it leaned a little bit hey, more towards you. I, didn't, you, I didn't, didn't get a boo. I, I think I had more no. more no. energetic you got, you got applause, a which included a boo. Right. So, <laughs> I think so Mike had so a boo. Mike had that's, that's no. negative. No, that, right? that, that was know, positive. You understand how that works? You're, you're not going to convince boo, me on that one. Bad thing. It's no, no. It's like imagine if I said I'm at a football game, and which team do you hate worse? And two teams come out. Like the people booing are saying <laughs> that, that team is what, worse. Yeah. Like totally, I'll, I'll go with that. But I think Mike had the same number of respondents in the applause. Mine were just a little more energetic. What do you think of this vendor marketing tactic? All right, gentlemen. Using humor in cold sales. How many how many uh, salespeople do we have in the audience? By applause. By applause. Don't, they can't hear you when you raise your hands, by the way. Just so you know. We have a few salespeople. All right. Does humor in cold sales ever work? Now, you've seen the funny emails from people you don't know and the gag gifts that just appear in the mail. Liren Scheinbach, CISO over at Platika, posted a photo of a spatula, the one you would use for spackling, and a cover letter he received from a salesperson asking if he'd like some help fixing the holes in his infrastructure. Ha, ha. Now, I want to mention Terry Gilliam, who's one of the founding members of Monty Python, noticed an interesting phenomenon when people don't like a joke. When they don't like it, they actually get angry, which is literally the opposite effect the salesperson wants. First, have either of you ever received a cold outreach that you found funny and you did respond? And second, have you actually gotten angry because you didn't <laughs> like a joke? And why doesn't humor work in cold sales outreach, Mike? I can't think of a time where I've ever responded positively to one of those. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind is the respond one, if you would like to set up a meeting, respond two, if you'd like me to come back later, respond three, if you're trapped in a well and need me to send help. It's like, it's always some variation that, that number three always changes. I think I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time you got that, it was a little funny. It was like a funny once. No. Not, no? Not, okay. Not I thought the me. first time no. I saw it, I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. I still didn't respond, but yeah. at least I didn't get <laughs> angry. No, I mean, it, that said, none of these make me angry. Um, so have you, have you ever gotten oh. angry? Like just oh, no. I've, so the, the challenge is that when you look at that cold sales outreach, first of all, if you're listening to this and you do sales development, recognize that you have the hardest job in the industry. And even if we are not responding to you, we still recognize that your job sucks because your job involves reaching out to people who don't want to talk to you. That said, like the joke cannot be on the person that you're trying to reach out to <laughs> when you're making fun of them, like this whole thing with the spatula, like you are talking down to the person saying, oh, you don't care about security. Trust me, the oh, CISO that, cares about security. That, that, By the way, in general, do you care about this? Do you care uh, about that? No, don't do that. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, I have my stock, you know, template response that tells people the answer is no, so I can at least get you to a quick no. Here's the FAQ. And every so often, I'd get somebody who would respond like, well, clearly you don't care about security. Yes. Oh. And I'm like, and, and <laughs> my first response is, I, and I never send it, so maybe I'm verbally sending it, clearly you don't care about sales. 
<laughs> like, because you just basically went from I was going to forget about you to now I will remember your company's name and did not want to do business yes. with in, you. In a bad way. In a bad way. Your company's name. So I think it can. there can be humor. It's hard if it's cold because you don't have shared context with somebody. But the humor needs to be about a third party, not about the person you're talking to. And it needs to be original. So if you find an approach that works, don't tell anyone. Because if you share it among your sales colleagues and say, ooh, I did this and it worked. We're all going to get it. We're all going to get it. And now that moment of levity that you got is instead replaced with, oh, my God. Like that first time that someone said, like, press three if you're trapped under your desk and you need me to call 911. I thought it was funny. Like I laughed. It was cute. It was better than what everything else I was getting. You're an easy audience, Andy. Oh, yeah, I'm not an easy <laughs> audience. But now, like, I probably get one of those a week. Yes. Yeah. And, and it really, like... That one is clearly a template that gets passed around. Yeah. And, you know, we get these quite frequently. And if it becomes a template, we're going to recognize it very quickly. Yeah. And and recognize the, the lack of originality and the lack of, you're not really interested in my time or, or, or my feedback if you're just sending the exact same thing to everyone. Yeah. If you're going to try humor, try self-deprecating humor. Like I have gotten the one that says, look, I know that you're getting a hundred of these messages a day and you probably that don't. That doesn't work either. No, no. Come on. If it does, if it's then followed with like, here's the two sentence description of your company. Cause I might re read that. And remember, I'm not going to re respond to you, but you at least have that moment where I'm like, great. I recognize that, you know, you've got a, a bad job to do. You made a joke at your own expense and I'm willing to at least read one more sentence. I think ultimately, though, what, what Terry Gilliam is onto is everyone has a different sense of humor, slightly. And you don't know, really, if you're doing cold. Don't, you don't know so what you're, you're doing. So you're massing emailing jokes. Right. 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 So, in fact, what you just heard is the things that I thought were funny, Mike didn't. Yep. Yes. And if you send the ma same mass email to both of them, one of them will get angry, the other one will go, eh. But you wouldn't get a response from either. <laughs> right. That's the key thing. Yeah, you're better off having people forget you sent the message than having an angry response. Yes. But you will never know which one it was because they're not going to give you a signal. Who's our sponsor this week? Constella Intelligence. Let me tell you about them. Ransomware, phishing, insider threats, and other digital attacks cost U.S. businesses trillions per year. The Colonial Pipeline hack that brought down the entire East Coast was the result of a key employee's compromised credentials. Constella Intelligence allows you to protect all of your key companies from digital risk. Everyone from executives to IT personnel, HR, and others by continuously monitoring their digital footprint detecting threats that others miss with real-time alerts and automated takedown to protect you and your company from a targeted attack. Try them for free over at constellatrial.com. And by the way, that's spelled C-O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A trial.com. And go there and see if your data has been exposed and take charge of your cyber defense strategy with Constella Intelligence. Visit them at Constella, that's con, Stella Intelligence. Dot com. What's the best way to handle this? So from our recent Ask a CISO Anything on the cybersecurity subreddit, I don't know if anyone got a chance to see that, but we do our AMAs on the cybersecurity subreddit often, and we did one. We got lots of great responses. A Redditor there asked this question. I work for a medium-sized company of 2,000 employees where I am the only security person. Yeah. The problem, the problem I'm facing, that's I think enough of a problem right there, <laughs> but the problem I am facing is new regulations are hitting us left and right that we need to become compliant while also keeping the organization secure. So how do you identify and prioritize what needs to be done first? I'm going to start with you, Mike. Is this a no-win situation? I mean, it just seems completely daunting. I remember reading this question on the AMA and just thinking, yikes, like what a hairy situation to be in. I don't think it's no win. But what I read between the lines of this one is the Redditor has kind of taken all of this on their shoulders to go solve. That somehow all of these regulations 
they have to solve it. It's their problem and it's their problem alone. And I think that's what they really should think about is how can I make sure that the business understands it's the business's problem and get leadership buy-in from there. And taking a look at the regulations, figuring out, out what they are, writing them down, writing them down in terms of the business needs, the business concerns, but also what are the security mechanisms that you can use to help? And that then becomes the package that you're presenting to leadership, getting their buy-in, getting their help by saying, these are our problems. These are your menu of solutions. Let's work together on these. And then you actually are moving into a place where the business recognizes that this is a business problem, not a security person thinking it's their problem. What do you think? Is, it, is this beyond daunting? So it's daunting because we're missing some information. I mean, obviously, the, the joking thing to put at the top of the list is go work, update your resume and talk to a recruiter. <laughs> um, but you know, what I was missing here is you know, who's actually responsible for security? Like they're the security person, but they work for somebody. That somebody's probably who the executives think is responsible for security. What are the tools that you actually have at hand? Is hiring an option? I assume not from the way the question was worded, but maybe it is. Are outside partners an option? Like this is the place where, you know, you reach out to a VAR and say, hey, I need some help here. Do you have a VCSO and maybe you have, you know, an audit firm and a pen test firm and somebody to solve these eight problems for me and you can come in and integrate them because it's just you. Maybe you have partners inside the organization who build tools that you can use. So it is a daunting task. You know, I've been there slightly smaller. I was the only one of 500. I turned that into a path to being a CISO by just tackling one problem at a time. Because here's the secret when you have too much work. Um, if you know how to juggle and somebody hands you three balls and says juggle, you can juggle pretty successfully. By the way, a little tidbit, I can juggle. Excellent. Good oh, good. Have. Then I can use you for this one. I don't think I've, I've ever done this one with you, David. If I hand you four balls and I tell you to juggle, how successful will you be? So I used to be able to juggle four. I can't anymore. Okay. But what would, so what would happen? You juggle two in each hand and I, I drop all four. Okay. If I handed you 17 balls and told you to juggle. I would throw all 17 in the air and they all hit the floor. Okay. But the right thing to do is set 14 of them down and juggle three. That I can do. And that's what most people forget is they get all of this work and they try to do it all at once. And instead, pick the things that will provide sustainable value once they're done. So is there something you can do that will automate, that will scale, and then as soon as that's done, move to the next thing. But don't try to push 17 projects forward at once because none of them will ever succeed. It's time for the audience question speed round. So I have in my hand here questions from you, audience, for our CISOs. And uh, we've got, how many go? One, two, three, four. We got uh, six of them here, actually. And let's just, in the last few minutes we have of the show, let's get through as many of these as we possibly can. All right. So um, what's the youngest age you can teach cyber and what should you be teaching at that age? That comes from Rick Torshin of Dynatrace. So I was teaching it to my kids basically as soon as they were born. Really? Yep. Hold it. So had they been on a computer at that time? You don't have to have them on a computer to start teaching them cyber. Okay. We so made what you, sure. So what, oh, hold on. I want to know, what are you explaining at this time? So we were teaching them things like privacy. Okay. That when people take a picture of you that's going to be posted on social media, it doesn't involve your face. And so they might not have recognized that lesson until they were, you know, five or six or seven, but it got to the point that if somebody pulled out a camera to take a picture, my kids would turn away. Really? And, like, and at what age were they doing that? They were probably doing that around six or seven. That if you put, if you were with us and you took out your phone to take a picture, my kids would turn away from you because you never let somebody take a picture of your face without your permission. It's never too early to start teaching uh, lessons that are applicable. So I, I thought you were going to say you were teaching them to remember complex passwords and <laughs> and, and rotate them frequently. That that mm -hmm. wasn't the lesson at age six. That, that, was that a, started that, at age three. that was actually was probably around like eight. eight. That was around eight, <laughs> eight yeah. or nine. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Unique passwords for every website. Have an algorithm and to generate them. Yep. Memorize them and, and then rotate them every ninety days. Yeah. Rotate the kids. Oh, I would love that one. <laughs> 
<laughs> that would be great. Hot swappable. <laughs> right. Redundant kids. Yeah, but don't, so, but, I, I don't, don't, I don't have with kids. Your, don't you do, I mean, my wife and I do that with our kids. Like if we're getting fed up, or like I'm handing them off to you right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah I mean, we joking, well, that's hot we, swappable adults. Though. Yes. We jokingly described our, our second as the advanced RMA for the first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. I don't know. Sound five or six sounds pretty good to me. I, I don't have what, kids. So you know what, I, but but I, what, would you, what could you teach a child at that age that would be appropriate at age five or six? I, I really think at those young ages, it's really just teaching them some common sense practices online and understanding some of the, the things that can go wrong. You know, just like the, the don't talk to strangers rule applied to online is that seems like a very good one to teach them at a very young age. Yeah, the first time they encounter a griefer in Minecraft, just tell them that griefers are all over the internet. Yes, they exist everywhere. That would, my son is a huge Minecraft fan. All right, let's go through the next one quickly. What's the one aspect of data security that's holding companies back? I know there's a lot, but just isolated to one. This comes from CJ Radford of Sotero. What is it? I think similar to what Andy was talking about with the trying to juggle 17 balls, it's you know trying to treat all risks as equal. Not everything is critical, not everything is low. You actually have to have some nuance to it. And if you're trying to treat everything with the same level of criticality of concern, you're not going to make any progress on any of them. All right. Andy? I think it's that data isn't centralized. Like people think about data lakes and data oceans. It's like data swamps. It is all over your organization. It's spread out. Um, and every time you turn your back, it moves and goes into somewhere else. So keeping track of all the data and applying policy everywhere, that's probably the single biggest challenge. How would an IT auditor become a CISO? And do you know of any who've actually done this? This comes from Tim Lortz, who works at Kaiser Permanente. What's your tip specifically for an IT auditor? So I think moving from audit into direct practice is part of that. Like having the background of being an auditor is valuable and fantastic, but the challenge is you have a reputation of always being on the outside looking in and getting your hands dirty and actually implementing security in any of the domains so that you have that credibility of having solved the problems and not just having found the problems. Yeah, I think I definitely agree that becoming the practitioner, like moving over, maybe even changing teams, however that, that works in your organization, and bringing that audit perspective, bringing that forward, and you can twist that to th talking about risk as well. And risk is, that's all we talk about as CISOs, is the trade-offs of risks. And that then moves you on that path to whatever's next, whatever's next, and to eventually you're a CISO at that point. All right. What's one tip to improve collaboration with the audit team, also from Rick Torsion of Dynatrace? So I, I think a lot of it is planning ahead and working with the audit team on what are the frameworks that are important? What is some of the past evidence that's been shared? And one of the things that we're actively working on is how do we make it easier to gather evidence for not only ourselves, but for other teams? That's making the auditor's lives easier. And that's, that makes everyone's lives easier at that point. Andy? I think it's understanding the different filters of what is a finding, because sometimes an internal audit team, for instance, that's reporting to the board, a finding isn't, here's a control you could have but don't have. It's actually, here's an indefensible absence of a control. So if they come to you and say, like, what are your problems? You give them 50 problems, like they might publish them all to the board, but they're now indefensible, so you have to fix all 50. Whereas you might have just said, look, like 47 of these are fine that we don't have a control. These three we need to fix. But if you didn't know as a CISO that giving them all 50 meant you were going to have to fix all 50 right now and disrupt everything, like you're speaking different languages, even though we're in such adjacent career fields sometimes. So understanding what does it mean to be a finding? What does risk mean? Because these are the same words, but different meanings depending on the context of who's talking about them. All right. Two last questions here. Uh, another one from CJ Radford of Sotero said, where are you investing? And I'm sure lots of places, but give me one significant place. Where are you investing to most significantly reduce your risk posture? Andy, you go first. Well, I just changed jobs. So I think that's <laughs> like, for me, that's a big one. But I think if I was looking at it from the C, so like, what are you investing in right now? It's really understanding how you're making the migration to cloud. 
Because what I think a lot of people started doing is saying, well, we'll take everything we did in the legacy enterprise and just copy it in the cloud. Yeah, we've heard this. And that's a really expensive way to not get security. What you really want to do is stop and rethink and say, like, how do I redesign for that new architecture? Because cloud doesn't actually look anything like enterprise. And so cloud security obviously isn't going to look like enterprise security. Yeah, so I would actually say cloud as well. So I'll come up with another one. So it's actually an, an interesting answer here. For me, it's uh, instrumentation and data collection and data analysis, really understanding all of the signals that, that all of our systems can send and be those security signals or not, instrumenting just your regular observability systems gives you a lot of value. Taking a look at all of that data and doing something with that, finding the needles and those particular stacks of needles, that's that's really where we're paying a lot of attention after uh, looking at all of the cloud uh, concerns. Very last question, and this comes from Josephine Falberg, who is at UCSF, and her husband wants to be a CISO, so she's concerned, and she asked this question. <laughs> it's a good place to start, Why? being concerned. What is the secret to managing stress as a CISO? Not being one. <laughs> no. So I'm, I'll jump with this one first because, you know, having just transitioned out of being a CISO, the most important thing is understanding that the job of the CISO is not to be up at night worrying about things that nobody else is worrying about. It's understanding that your job is to advise the rest of the business. And if the business says we're going to tolerate that risk, then you have to move on from it. You don't get to carry that and say, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Because stress is your body telling you that your belief in the world and the actual world are not the same thing. And so you need to bring those together as a CISO and say, my job is to help the company make better risk choices. That doesn't mean they don't take any risk. They're going to take risk. I'm not always going to agree with it, but at the end of the day, that's the choice. Mike? Yeah, I think it's it's a really good point to recognize that you shouldn't be taking it all on your shoulders. For me, from my perspective, it's really finding outlets, finding other things to do that you can kind of move your stress with you to go have an outlet somewhere else. So you're not taking it out on, on other people. Like, like hosting that, a podcast. Like hosting a podcast. Yes, is, that, is this a stress reducer? For uh, it's like? more of like a stress increaser. So oh, I was a stress yes. reducer for me. Yes, so. Wow. Well. Well, I am glad that I'm helping one of you and not the other. Uh, <laughs> Story right. of my life, David. Thank you so, so much. Well, that becomes the end of our show. I want to thank my co-hosts here, both of them, Andy Ellis, who is uh, operating partner over at YL Ventures, and Mike Johnson uh, as well. And I also want a huge thanks to all three of our sponsors here. You can see them right up there, for those of you in the room. Code 42, Sotero, and Constella Intelligence. If you haven't had a chance to talk with them, just chat with them. They, uh, they've they all been just great sponsors of the CISO series. We greatly appreciate everything that they've been doing uh, for us. And they do actually have some pretty impressive solutions. So please check them out as well. Uh, more, if you're listening to this, just go to CISOseries.com and check our post and you can find more information about them there as well. Um, in addition, I want to say thanks to uh, SFI Saka for inviting us to be here at the event. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate that. And uh, I'll let the two of you have uh, any closing comments. Mike? Uh, so I actually just want to echo uh, David's thank you for having us. Um, you know, great audience here today. Love actually having the participation. Usually I'm looking at David on a Zoom. Um, so it's really nice to actually have some folks here. This, one, and, this is the first person, time we got together since the pandemic. Yes. It just dawned on me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so thank you for, for having the event. Thank you for being here and, and thank you for having us. And I want to say thank you for all the work you do every single day, even though I have no idea what most of you are specifically <laughs> doing, but that's okay. It's understanding that our organizations operate and function because of the work of lots of people who often are not celebrated and heralded. Like, for instance, I'm going to thank the people who are going to have to go clean up all of our audio, uh, especially the one who has it's to go Andrew. clean up. Andrew's going to uh, Yeah, go, go clean up the moment I slipped and used yep. uh, Don't worry, uh, I'll put a, a note. Small <laughs> there. Yeah, I put a note. <laughs> all right. 
Well, uh, thank you again, and we greatly appreciate all your contributions and listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.